Welcome to the Cult of the Clock Tower. I am Andrew Nathanson. Every other week, a special guest and I have an in-depth discussion about a character from the game Blood on the Clock Tower. Today's character is the Mathematician, a townsfolk from the Sects and Violets edition, whose ability reads, Each night, you learn how many players' abilities worked abnormally since dawn due to another character's ability. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're talking about the Mathematician, and I am joined by Eric. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. Uh, So, Eric, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, my name's Eric. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. Uh, My board game group at work is a big fan of puzzles and deception games. We've played plenty of Secret Hitler, Avalon, and so on. We've done a bunch of escape rooms together. So when I traveled to a game night at a different office and met Russell, your guest from the Ravenkeeper episode, uh, who introduced me to this fantastic game that combines all these things I love and fixes a lot of the problems I had with classic werewolf and mafia, I just had to go home and make a grimoire and bring it to my friends, and we've been playing it almost nonstop for a year. Yeah. That's awesome. We're going to get into this with the first or zero with section here. This is something that a listener requested me to add, just give a little bit more information on how the character actually works that they can listen to the rest of the episode with context. Um, So yeah, we're just going to quickly go over how the mathematician works in more detail than just its ability. So uh, essentially what the mathematician does is they learn a number each night. And that number is the number of players whose abilities functioned abnormally uh, due to other characters' abilities, importantly. So what exactly that means is, for instance, if a character was drunk or poisoned and they got wrong information, that would count towards the mathematician. If they were drunk and poisoned and got true information, that would not count because that ability, from their perspective, is working correctly. Even though they are drunk or poisoned, um, if they get true information, it doesn't register to mathematician. So that's important to note, is that mathematician keeps track of like the true game state whether or not uh it doesn't care about like statuses and also like i said it doesn't care about abnormal info that the character causes for themselves the most common ones that i can think of in sex and violets are when the snake charmer uh has swapped with the demon and the old snake charmer is poisoned that snake charmer is poisoning itself so that doesn't count when they're hunting for the demon so even if they do pick the demon and don't swap with them that will not count to mathematician because they're poisoning themselves is that correct yeah uh that's i think or at least as of my understanding right now from like definitely the uh developers went back and forth on this for a while that might change in the final rules once we have like a finalized version of the rule book that's publicly available i'm going to try to go through and correct any mistakes i've made in the episodes but uh, as i understand it that is correct right now okay yeah i always thought that it was more of the former snake charmer is poisoning the new snake charmer since it's technically a new character coming to play so it... right yeah i've i've also heard that but that is not the latest thing i've heard <laughs> so it's a bit confusing so that i think is the most common one and like i said that is yeah yeah that could change uh i'll try to update this in a future episode uh, another one that is commonly kind of an ability working abnormally, but it's caused by themselves, is when a pit hag tries to create a character that's in play. Uh, that is kind of, you could argue that that's their ability working abnormally, but in any case, it's from their own ability that it doesn't work, so that does not count towards mathematician. Right. When the pit hag fails to create a character that's in play, the pit hag is working as intended, so that's why yeah. it would not count. The mathematician basically counts right. any character that is not working as intended, even if they got wrong information. So... If you are making a custom script with the fortune teller, for instance, and they choose the red herring and get a yes, the fortune teller is still working as intended, even though their information is technically wrong. So that would not count towards a mathematician. Yeah. Do you want to go through some other examples here that can happen in, in Sex and Violets or outside of Sex and Violets? Because uh, this, is, this is one of the few characters that gets a little bit trickier when you take it outside of its home edition. Yeah, gladly. So uh, first off, if the demon voted yesterday, the flower girl should get a yes. But if the demon was a Vortox, then they would instead get a no, so that would count. Uh, If the philosopher becomes a town crier and makes the original town crier drunk, and then the town crier, of course, gets wrong information, that would count. As you already mentioned, uh, if the drunk town crier does get correct information, then they did work as intended, even though they're drunk, so that would not count. Uh, Another one is the dreamer. Let's say the dreamer, sorry, not the dreamer, but the recluse. Uh, Misregistering can also count for the mathematician. So if the dreamer chooses the recluse, Uh, they should see the recluse as the good role. That would be the dreamer working as intended. However, if the recluse registers as an evil character, and the dreamer sees that evil character and then some other good character, 
then the dreamer failed to work as intended due to misinformation that wasn't necessarily drunk or poisoning, but was still misinformation. So that would also count. Yep. Um, we already mentioned fortune teller. Another one that's a little strange is uh, the mathematician does not distinguish between good and evil characters. Uh, so if the demon chooses a player who's alive, that player should die. But if that player is protected by a monk, or the pit hag has made deaths arbitrary tonight, or for some other reason that player does not die when they were supposed to, that would also count, because the demon did not function the way it was supposed to. Yes, yeah, so that's actually part of why when the pit hag makes it so that deaths are arbitrary that night, it's still important to wake the demons and ask who they pick, because whether or not that player dies affects whether or not they registered a mathematician. Um, yeah, so I think that's good uh, for the overview. Hopefully that clears things up, and hopefully I'm not accidentally spreading misinformation that isn't currently true about the self-poisoned snake charmer. Um, just keep an eye out for rules updates, and like I said, uh, as soon as the, the actual rules are available in their finalized form, I'm going to go through and try to correct every mistake I've made on the show. Hopefully there won't be too many. Yeah, there's a couple other weird edge cases, like if a demon targets a dead player, would that player have died and would that count? It's not really clear. Uh, another one that I've seen yeah. debated is if a drunk witch targets somebody, do you count it when they curse the person because the person was not cursed? Or would you count it when the person would have nominated and didn't die because that's when their ability would take effect? So there's definitely still some edge cases out there that we will hopefully see some clarification on before the game's final release. But yeah. for now, uh, what's most important is that you definitively choose how you're going to run it and that the rest of the group that you are currently either storytelling for or playing with are all on the same page. As far as the witch thing, I'm pretty sure it's when the person would uh, nominate, not when they apply the curse. I'm really not sure about that one, to be honest. Like, hmm. Yeah, I've seen that one go both ways, and I really don't even know where I stand on that. Like, My first inclination would be to agree, but I, I don't know. I ran it that way once, or I think I actually ran the poisoner that way once, or a monk or something. Something similar that had like an effect that doesn't take place yet, and my player is going to argue with me with it. Yeah, argued with me over it later on in the game. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I have not thought about it. <laughs> um, yeah, not a big concern yeah. right now. Yeah, like Eric said, though, make a decision in the moment and stick with it. <laughs> and then try to figure out the real things once we know the real rules. Well, anyway, let's get into this, the first section here, which is actually playing the game as the mathematician. Um, so you're in the first night. You are the mathematician. You're going to get some information. What are you thinking about before you get that information? Or perhaps more importantly, after you have your information? Uh, what, do you, what are you like trying to do overall in the game as a mathematician? Well, the mathematician's in a pretty unique position compared to most townsfolk in Sex and Violets. Uh, most townsfolk have information that kind of creates these branching stories depending on which demon is in play. The amount of information can vary anywhere from all true to all false, of course. So whereas in Trouble Brewing, the fortune teller could say with some measure of confidence that the demon is among a small set, the flower girl, on the other hand, would have to say, oh, well, the non-vortox demon is over here, or the vortox demon is over there, or none of this matters and an Odashi is next to me. So mm -hmm. because so many of the townsfolk have these branching narratives and they need to kind of uh, assimilate them with each other, uh, we have the mathematician who's kind of a unique character. Instead of creating these stories, you are the editor. You are the one that can look at all these narratives and say, hey, that makes sense, and hey, that doesn't, based on the information I got. Yeah, it's, you, your, your information is really pretty much useless in a vacuum. Uh, right, exactly. But fortunately, you always have other characters in the game to help you out. And I, I think it is really interesting character in that you're always looking at kind of the overall narrative. You're you're also like you're also not even just interacting with one or two other characters. You're acting with every single character in the game. You have to keep that in mind. So I think that one really important thing for the mathematician is to try to fit everything together into narratives at all times that account for absolutely everything. And if you can't account for absolutely everything, you need to figure out where you're wrong. And some and there will often be ways, like multiple ways for all of your information to fit together. But you have your your own information is a very powerful tool for eliminating a lot of possible worlds right and figuring out the demon is crucial for the good team to figure out where the evil team is they have yeah. a ton of information like the flower girl can find the demon very easily on their own and if you have a town crier and clockmaker working together that works well too but because the demons create these all these different possibilities uh, figuring out which demon is in place is just super important and the mathematician is one of the best characters for doing that so I think a lot of people, when they first look at the mathematician, they have trouble seeing how it's useful. And I can totally understand that because, like we were just saying, it's not useful on its own. 
but I think once you realize how good the mathematician is at like narrowing down what the demon is, that's when you start really realizing like the first part of why it's powerful. Like to some extent, the the, the mathematician's ability kind of says like, learn what demon is in play, which is pretty good. Um, it's it's not perfect, but that part of the ability is one of the strongest things uh, at first. And then once you get better at using the information, then the the other parts of the ability become strong as well. But I think that's the first thing that's quite strong about it, is learning what demon is in play. Right. And the first two nights, I would say, are the most crucial for that. Yeah. The mathematician is a fantastic Nodashi finder. Uh, we'll go into more detail on that in a bit. But in a nutshell, based on what you get on the first two nights, you can try to locate where a Nodashi might be because some characters act on certain nights, whereas others don't. Uh, and within the first two nights, you'll have a chance to get information about all the townsfolk in the game, since all of them will have information by the second night. Yeah, the only thing that can throw that off a little bit is players dying, but typically the Nodashi isn't going to be killing the people next to them, I think, most of the time on the first night. Just just like give them a chance to get their bad information out there, potentially. Yeah, so you that like you said, very good at finding Nodashi. Um, if you get a zero, like a bunch of zeros at the start, then it's a good sign you're in a Fengu game, or possibly Vigor Mortis, who hasn't killed their minions yet, or even Vortox. Like, zero, zero is probably the most confusing first night thing, I think. Yeah, zero, first zero, couple nights. zero is kind of a no signal almost. It could be literally any demon, or it could be a Vortox. Uh, but the nice yeah. thing about a zero, assuming that it's not a Vortox, is that means everybody got correct information. That means your team yeah. is moving <laughs> forward. You've gotten progress towards finding the evil team. Yeah, and, and basically it still allows you to rule out any narrative in which somebody is drunk or poisoned to get, give them bad information. You can, you can with confidence say, well, unless it's you, you can with confidence say either I am drunk or poisoned or everybody is getting bad information or nobody is. And... That seems like a lot of possibilities, but it's actually fairly small. <laughs> yeah, plus it also has the nice little side effect of if an evil player comes forward, bluffs something, and gets information wrong, you can kind of point a finger at them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I think that one thing to keep in mind also is that in the early game, it's very hard to think of the entire game. Uh, and that's for quite a few reasons, one of them being that everybody's alive, so like you have the most information to keep track of. Also, not everybody is coming out with their characters. So I think at the start of the game, you can be more focusing on the things like, all right, what, what demon do I think is in play? And like trying to get people to play along a little bit and be like, okay, let's just consider some possibilities. And I don't think you're ever going to come up with a perfectly clear picture of everything that happened in the first couple days. Later in the game, though, as people die and as people come out with their characters, you can start really putting together very full pictures of the game. And that, I think, is when the mathematician really becomes its most useful. And also when that's happening feel free to encourage people to like take a step back f with you and go through their first few days like once everyone's admitted their character then you can say okay let's go through the first few days of information and really step through it and try to put together the worlds that make sense um because that can give you a lot of information that wasn't available to you at the time but as long as you remember your information everyone has a decent idea of what they did during the game information putting together information from multiple days is going to be even more powerful than just using your information in the late game so with all of this in mind you've drawn the token you're the mathematician it's the first night you get some information uh do you want to talk about like specifically what you're thinking about based on what information you got yeah the the main two things i can get are a zero or a non-zero uh, most of the time i don't care a whole lot what the non-zero number is at least early in the game but if I got a zero, it could be anything. We don't really know anything yet. There's not much to share. Uh, the best thing I can do on the first day is just kind of talk to people, maybe get some claims, try to share my information with them and get them to share information with me. I'd really like to survive the second night as well because the first two nights are really useful for the mathematician. But yeah. I'm also not the biggest demon target despite being pretty useful early on. So I'm not too afraid to go out and talk to people. Mathematician is one of those, like, I like to call them arena characters, because you kind of, you jump into the middle of the ring, you go out, you talk to people, you try to get things going, you know, it's a character that you have a good excuse to go talk to everyone, and you're just, you're not, you don't really have to feel all that afraid. Yeah, it's true. They're, they're like, they're a strong ability, but they can also kind of just exist, and the demon won't bother them that much, because most demons don't care that much about them. Uh... Perhaps an exception to that might be if there is a Nodashi, because I think the mathematician is particularly strong against you. 
Um, but then you can at least try to read into them killing you. Um, right. So that's if you got a zero. What if you got a non-zero? Yeah, non-zeros are really interesting on the first day because there's only three things that can cause that. Uh, just to take a step back, so there's six characters in the game that can either count towards the mathematician or cause others to, since literally every character could be drunk in some way. Uh, those right. characters are the philosopher, who can drunk a character they duplicate, the sweetheart, if they trigger, the pit hag, if they make deaths arbitrary and the demon fails to kill someone, uh, and then the three demons, Vigor Mortis, Nodashi, and Vortox, who all cause misinformation or poison in different ways. Right. So if I get a non-zero on the first night, I know, or any time really, I know at least one of those must be in play. So if I get it on the first night where the sweetheart could not have died yet and the pit hag hasn't acted yet and the demons are mutually exclusive, then I know that there has to be either a Nodashi, Vortox, or Philosopher in play. Mm -hmm. And unless the Philosopher comes out later on and says, hey, sorry, I might have drunk somebody, I got greedy, I acted on the first night, uh, you already have two demons eliminated from the mix, and that's extremely powerful. Yeah, just a one on the first night is, um, or I mean, not necessarily a one. It could be any number that isn't zero is going to be super powerful for you. And then, like you were saying, there's only six characters. So even a, a non-zero on any night is going to be quite good for you because it tells you that one of those six is in play. I actually think it's a really good framing of it in general, uh, is like having a very clear idea that one of those six characters are in play. Because even if you are drunk or poisoned or whatever, that is still because of one of those characters. Uh, and so being able to track them down is going to give you information. Right. I do want to give a quick mention that uh, madness, of course, can also cause misinformation and would not counter as the mathematician. So unfortunately, that mechanic is kind of just a big wrench in the mathematician's plans. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can set it aside. Hopefully there's no mutant or Cernovus and we can just kind of not worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and usually I think that by the end of the game, you can kind of track that a bit better also. Right. The game's probably not going to end before the final three, unless good has already won, barring evil twin, I suppose. Uh, so yeah, you'll probably have time to backtrack and figure this stuff out later on. And that's, as mentioned earlier, uh, that's when your mathematician info could be the most useful. So I think that's a good, good overview of what you're thinking on the first day, uh, trying to survive until the second day is an important thing. Um, and then let's just talk about how your first two nights of information work together. Um, we kind of mentioned it briefly earlier, but um, I think it's worth going into the uh, distinct or the main possibilities here, which are getting a zero, then a zero, a zero, then a non-zero, or a non-zero, then a zero, or a non-zero, then another non-zero number. <laughs> so zero, zero, like we already said, I think we already went over that one pretty much. Uh, it just means that the info in the game is all correct or all wrong, uh, or you're just wrong. Zero non-zero, I think, is one of the more interesting things to get because um, it's hard for that situation to happen, I think. The main things that can explain that is a Vigor Mortis killing a minion, which then poisons someone for the second night, or a Nodashi poisoning people who don't act until the second night. So that could be someone like uh, an artist who gets information during that first day, or... Um, or a juggler who just acted, Oracle. And that can help you track things down as soon as you get that zero, then non-zero. It obviously depends on what it is. If it's just a one, that might lean you more towards Vigor Mortis. If it's a two, then it might lean you more towards Nodashi. Of course, it could always be a sweetheart or a philosopher, but hopefully those characters would tell you that, and <laughs> you don't have to think too hard about it. Uh, the other situation is a non-zero, then a zero, or two non-zeros in a row. Both of those are... I would say they're they're like consistent with a Nodashi um, or a Vortox most of the time will be the explanation for that. Yeah, and the second night isn't really going to give you more info about that, unfortunately. Yeah. So they're kind of the equivalent. Like you've got two demons narrowed out. That alone is extremely powerful, but the second night is just kind of a no signal. I, there's some implications to the Nodashi, which we'll get to in a sec, but beyond that, it's it's not super useful. Or sorry, not more useful. The second night isn't more useful after that first night. Yeah, if you get the same number twice in a row, I think that's especially true. If you get different numbers, then that can be pretty helpful once you have more uh, of the information coming together to point to something and like a particular narrative of what happened. Uh, but the same number twice in a row can be very difficult to parse. Uh, I want to give a quick mention to the Vortox as well. Uh, in a Vortox game, a lot of people, pretty much every info role is going to get wrong information. So whatever number you get is not going to be terribly helpful. Uh, generally, when I'm playing the mathematician, 
Uh, I, I just kind of cast out the possibility of a vortex altogether because I'm trusting my teammates to figure that out. The mathematician gets information about information, so if the information is all crap, then there's not a lot you can really do to deduce it, whereas other characters can compare their information against the state of the game. Uh, the flower girl, for instance, if all alive players voted and if they get a no, then they're going to suspect there's a vortex because, you know, that's, that's impossible. The demon has to be alive. Whereas the mathematician yep. has no real way of doing that. So, as a mathematician, I, I feel like you should just kind of almost entirely cast out the possibility of a vortex, just because there's not much you can really do about it. Every signal you possibly get could just be a vortex game. There is one specific situation where the mathematician info can be useful in a vortex game. Uh, if the good team is already very confident that there's a vortex, and you have exactly three people besides yourself, claiming info rolls, and the number you get is a three, then you know that all three of them can't be telling the truth, because all three of them must right. have gotten wrong information, which means that three would be the correct answer, which you got. Therefore, it cannot be the correct answer. Yeah, so there's there is definitely that. It's, it's pretty difficult for that to come up, uh, and that will mostly happen later in the game. But when you can kind of catch people in that, then it's pretty good. I, I do. There is also the possibility that you can figure out there's a Vortox by getting, what, I would have to be like a three on the first night. <laughs> then you know for sure there's a Vortox, but that's maybe more of something for us to talk about as storytellers that you just probably shouldn't do. But if you get that, then sometimes you can just say for sure on the first night that there's a Vortox in play. Yeah, guys, I got a 76. The storytellers just kept flashing fingers at me all night. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't count. I, I don't know. It might, be, it might have been 75. I hope that doesn't like throw off the whole game. Uh, <laughs> be quite a bluff. It would be, and I, 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 there have been times that I've done that as a storyteller, just given the mathematician some absurdly high number, uh, just to see what they do with it later in the game. They usually figure out that it's a vortex. <laughs> <laughs> they could be drunk though. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, that's the other thing I'd like to mention. Uh, the mathematician themselves might be next to a nodashi, which, in which case, of course, their information is also a no signal, but they don't know that. Uh, but that's not really that bad for the good team, because if you keep getting zeros, then your information is almost right anyway, because you're poisoned, which means that nobody, only one other person is poisoned. So even if you keep getting zeros, you know, it's, it's not entirely throwing you off. And if you do get ones or other non-zeros, then... Uh, you still get the signal that somebody in the game is poisoned, which can still be kind of helpful. So a mathematician sitting next to the Nodashi and being poisoned isn't really that big of a deal. Yeah. Let's talk about the rest, uh, the other stuff with the Nodashi, where the Nodashi is sitting next to someone else. Because obviously, if it's next to you, it's hard to figure anything out. Yeah, no townsfolk can ever find a Nodashi next to them. But I think that the mathematician is very good at finding Nodashi in other places. Yeah, so different characters act on different nights. Uh, the clockmaker acts only on the first night. Uh, some act every single night or day, such as the Philosopher and Savan. Uh, some townsfolk act starting on the second night, such as the Flower Girl, Oracle, uh, Jugglers only the second night. Some only act once and they can kind of choose when to do so, like the Seamstress or Artist or and the Sage doesn't really get to choose, but you know, they're a one time. Yeah. So <laughs> depending on when you get your numbers, zeros or non-zeros, you can try to guess where Nodashi is in comparison to the, the roles that are being claimed. If you get a zero and then a non-zero, for instance, and it happens to be a Nodashi game, even if you don't necessarily know that, a Nodashi is most likely not next to a clockmaker, and most likely their neighbors are people that did not act on the first night, and one person that did act on the second night, when maybe a sage or somebody that hasn't acted yet. Yeah, and, and vice versa, if you get a non-zero number, then you get a zero, and you have narrowed it down to Nodashi. That tells you that they, it's very possible that they were next to a clockmaker. Um, or a seamstress who used their ability on the first night or something. Yeah, so I think that's those are the big things, is knowing when characters act at night, keeping that in mind. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that not every character wants to tell the truth, because the outsiders might tell you roles that they're not actually, that are not their actual roles. Uh, you know, the snake charmer probably doesn't want to tell you that they're an info role, at least not right away. So it does take time before this information can really come out and be synthesized, but assuming the Nodashi doesn't get the chance to move, uh, the mathematician should be able to find them eventually. Yep, exactly. Which is which kind of ties into the mathematician is a high priority target for the Nodashi because they can very easily tell that the Nodashi's in play and possibly where they are. Also, uh, uh, keeping in mind that you can also get uh, information after like players are swapped around. Like, say someone claims they got turned into an outsider, 
then if the Nodashi was next to them, you could expect that their poison is now extending an extra person. So if your information changed at night, that could be an ind indication that that is in fact the case. Yeah, that's definitely something to watch for. If you've been getting ones every night and then suddenly it's zeros, then yeah, maybe the flower girl got turned into a, a sweetheart and now somebody else is poisoned who's not getting info. Yeah. And of course, always keep in mind that it could be yourself that that is happening to. <laughs> You want to talk about the snake charmer a little bit. I think that's one of the more interesting interactions. Obviously, we already talked about how it doesn't register to themselves. But if the snake charmer is being made drunk or poisoned by another character, such as Sweetheart or Philosopher or Nodashi, then they're only going to register to you on the nights that they chose the demon, because otherwise, even though they're poisoned, their ability is still, for all intents and purposes, working correctly. So like, if they're choosing non-demons, then... Sure, they're drunk, but it doesn't matter because they wouldn't have swapped anyway, so that's not an abnormality. So that sort of that sort of turns the snake charmer into a demon finder without hurting themselves. <laughs> like normally the snake charmer's like, yeah, if I find the demon, I'm going to put myself in a worse position most of the time. Uh, but if they're drunk, then with your help, they can help you find the demon. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no way to determine that the snake charmer is drunk or poisoned unless they've checked their neighbors. But yeah, it's true the snake charmer can potentially be a very good ally with the mathematician because together they can find the demon if the snake charmer is you know being disabled by something yeah i, I think the most common um, situation this would happen in is if the philosopher turns into a snake charmer which can happen from time to time oh that would take some really interesting coordination on the good team have the philosopher intentionally drunk the snake charmer then have the snake charmer go around trying to find somebody while the mathematician is helping them scan. Yeah, I could. Yeah, a no-risk snake charmer would be really powerful, but I think keeping all of those characters alive for that to work would be really challenging. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen someone intentionally set that up, but I have seen it happen by accident. Uh, I don't know if the players quite realized it, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but when it happens, it's a very powerful situation for as long as you can keep it going. Yeah, the mathematician's also a really good excuse for the snake charmer to start to check their neighbors at the start of the game. Uh, generally, most townsfolk don't want to focus on their neighbors because if your neighbor turns out to be the demon, the information you get is going to be completely useless. If you learn that your neighbor's not the demon, then whatever, they still might be the demon, they just have to be the Nodashi. But the snake charmer can do so with a little less risk and a little less reward because, you know, they might still be eliminating everything except that person being Nodashi. Uh, and, uh, of course, they have less, a lower chance of swapping. But if there's a mathematician in the game and you chose your neighbor and it was the Nodashi, you've just given the mathematician the very powerful signal that there is a Nodashi or Vortox in the game. As we mentioned earlier, uh, a one on the first night is really useful for the good team, and you've just provided that for your good team. So if you, even if you don't believe there's a mathematician in the game, since I guess you have no information at the start of the game as a snake charmer, I would still argue that picking your neighbors is actually a really good play. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I actually just recorded the snake charmer episode recently, and we didn't mention anything like that. Uh, I had, oh man, I'm looking forward yeah, to that. Yeah, I was not thinking of mathematician at the time, but uh, that is a really good interaction to watch out for. And like, if you have nothing better to do as a snake charmer on your first night, you might as well pick your pick your neighbors. Yeah, yeah snake charmer is such a great character. I'm looking forward to hearing that episode. Yeah, it is. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, the other main townsfolk you're interacting with is the philosopher, um, who can possibly make someone drunk just at any point, and hopefully they'll be forthcoming about it. Yeah, this is one of those things where, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you're probably going to find out later on, because the philosopher is a powerful character, they're probably going to become a powerful character, so they're probably not going to out themselves early in the game, but later on you can backtrack and see, okay, the philosopher acted on the second night, and they may have drunk this person, and my number indicates that they may or may not be telling the truth, because, you know, if the philosopher drunk somebody who is in play, and you as a mathematician got a zero, it's possible the philosopher's lying, and it's possible the person the philosopher supposedly drunk is lying. Right. So you can cast a little extra suspicion on those two. But neither of those cases, that's still very useful for you. Uh, zero is certainly useful if they're both getting the same information. Oh, that's true. Because then you know that the information is probably true, regardless of whether any of them are lying. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually something we should probably talk about, and I'm sure we will talk about uh, with the storytelling section, which is like, a lot of the time it'll be interesting to just give true information to poisoned players and uh, with, a with a mathematician in play. It makes their life a little bit harder, but also like it's counterbalanced by you know giving correct information. So that's something you always want to watch out for. But generally, if the storyteller is giving drunken poisoned players correct information, that's more of a net positive than the, the slight negative effect it has on your own ability. Right, exactly. 
other than all these specific cases we've talked about, I think that the the biggest piece of advice I would give to a mathematician is that like you should be trying to solve the whole game. And that sounds daunting, but it's I find like if I'm the mathematician on the last night or on the last day, I'm going not going to vote to execute someone unless the storyteller is really forcing us along. But I want to try to solve everything in the game before I make a nomination and like figure out which narrative for the entire game pretty much I am most confident in. And that's a lot to do, but it's really can be worthwhile to just step through everything and find the world that makes sense. And if you can't find a world that makes sense, I, well, I mean, obviously one exists, so you should be able to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, if you can't find one that exists, then you should look at Vortex as the most likely possibility. Yeah, I guess that's true. Although, I guess I guess that's you're probably including that as yeah, one that, of that the is still worlds that is one at. of the worlds <laughs> uh, that you should be able to figure out. Like, so if you roll out everything else, then you're in Vortex land. But you probably already knew that most likely. Uh, like you were saying, in Vortex games, there's not that much to really re- like. Your ability often it often isn't going to do much beyond add a little bit of confirmation that there's a Vortex in play. But yeah, and if, if there's not a Vortex in play, then figuring out what world you're in is going to be very useful at the end of the game. And I, I mean, I would say that everybody should be doing that, but the mathematician, their ability in particular is much less useful if you're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just being the editor for the stories that are going on in the game is just so powerful. Like, you're the one that can tell the Oracle who's next to a player that died at night, who's, who's been getting a zero, whether or not they should consider Vigor Mortis as still a possibility or not. Yeah. Uh, you can kind of, like we said, work with the snake charmer to tell him that, hey, you, you picked these four people, but I got a one on one of these nights. It's possible that the person you picked actually was the demon and you were poisoned by XYZ. Yep. You were drunk by the sweetheart or poisoned by Vigor Mortis or something. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's an ability that gives you a lot of information that can be hard to figure out what to do with. But when you figure it out, it's going to be very powerful. Yeah, this character is just really underrated and overlooked. Like, I agree. This character can do so much. Uh, they can be so useful. It's a really fun character to play, too, and everybody just kind of forgets about yeah, it. Yeah, if it's in the hands of somebody who isn't playing the game in that way, where they're trying to synthesize absolutely everything, like that's what I'm usually doing most games anyway. So for me, the mathematician is a really fun character because it like plays into that that the way I already approached the game. But if, it, if but if it goes to someone who isn't, then it just kind of can seem like a non-character a lot of the time, which, you know, it's not necessarily as fun, but I would encourage players to always be thinking um, that when, when they get the mathematician token, I think, like you're saying, the idea of being the editor is really interesting, and, like, that's a good way to encourage players to, to look at the mathematician. All right, let's move into section two, which is bluffing as the mathematician. Uh, I think this is a interesting bluff there's a lot of a lot of things you can do with it but i think that the main thing i would say about it as a bluff is that it's pretty safe there are things you can bluff that won't draw very much attention to you whether you're evil and you don't want attention drawn to you or you're good and you just want to say something for now to cover up like while you're waiting for the perfect time to reveal your information I feel like the mathematician is one of the best ways to just say stuff and not have people pay much attention to it. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, mathematician, oracle, and seamstress are my go-to bluffs when I'm an outsider or a snake charmer. Because, <laughs> you know, like you just said, you can kind of provide information that might or probably won't cause a lot of destruction on the game. Like, if you're an outsider and you believe it might be a Fangu game and you say, oh, I'm actually just the mathematician and I keep getting a zero, you're basically telling everybody the truth. You're basically telling everybody, hey, there's probably a lot of true information going on, but also don't kill me. I'm not an outsider. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. Um, yeah, especially saying zero, like, obviously if you say you got a one or a two on the first night, then people are going to be using that and trying to figure out where that misinformation was uh, because then you're strongly implicating certain things of happening. But if you say a zero, that fits in with every demon, right? Like, every demon could give you a zero. So it's believable when you say that. And maybe eventually right. people will question it, but at first they don't really have a reason to. Yeah, and I think uh, we mentioned this. I mentioned the Snake Charmer and the Outsiders are probably the main characters that want to claim something else. The Outsiders because they don't want to be targets and don't want to become the Fengu and the Snake Charmer because they might switch teams, all five of those characters may switch teams at some point in the game. And I'm, I'm sure this will be discussed more in other episodes, like the Fengu episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 
uh, as those characters, if you provide a lot of really accurate, good information for your team, and then suddenly you switch to the other team later in the game, you've just done yourself a massive disservice. Yeah. So Mathematician is a great character to claim for like an outsider, for instance, because you can tell people you've been getting zeros, you can tell them the truth that it's probably a Thingu game without actually saying you're a uh, mutant or whatever. Mutant, of course, because you have to. Uh, but in the event that you do become the Thingu, you're not completely stuck in a hole either, because you can say, oh guys, I suddenly started getting ones, maybe it's a Vigor Mortis game, let's go off some other tangent. Yeah. And maybe that's not the best example because the outsider count will probably confuse whether it's a Vigor Mortis game or not. But the point is there that like you also maintain the possibility of throwing wrong information and kind of playing to your new team should you switch teams partway through the game. Yeah, the Mathematician has an ability that um, you can play it so that you're very much in the background and then you can suddenly make it so that your information becomes very important to the game if you need to uh, as a bluff. For that reason, I actually think it's very like often a very good evil bluff. Because if you need to, at the right moment, you can throw doubt on a certain narrative by saying that some of the information involved in that narrative is wrong. Yeah, should we get into evil then? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, one, one last note on good. I think it's also a pretty good bluff if you're just trying to stay alive. Um, like we mentioned earlier, the mathematician's often not going to be a first target. So it's a pretty good bluff for like a savant or whatever to throw out, like give some information that's not going to hurt the team too much. Because uh, the other players probably aren't going to be thinking about it too much, and also won't draw any attention to you to get yourself killed. I think. Yeah, neither team really wants to kill a mathematician most of the time. They're useful enough that the good team doesn't want to Vortox sacrifice them, and they're not useful enough that the evil team thinks, "Oh, high priority, kill that guy right away." Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's get into evil though. So, mathematician is, I would say, a very strong evil bluff. Um. Despite, oh, absolutely. despite being kind of a background character in a lot of games. I mean, obviously, that's to some extent a benefit, uh, like if the demon wants to fade into the background, although I would also argue that that's very difficult to do in Sex and Violets um, as the demon. Like, if, if, I were to, if I were to choose between, like, actively bluff a lot of things that throws the narrative in the wrong way or in the wrong direction or try to fade into the background... Like, Trouble Brewing, you can get away with fading into the background. Sex and Violets, I think, that most often that's going to be a losing strategy, because eventually everyone will just figure out it's you. Right, exactly. As we mentioned, like, the good team has a lot of information that will lead them to the evil team, so it's really crucial for the evil team and the storyteller to confuse which demon is actually in play to keep the good team guessing. Because once they figure out, oh, it's a Vortox game, guess what? We're going to find the demon really, really fast, because now we just invert everything. Yeah. So for that reason, I would lean toward this more as a minion bluff, but it's by no means a bad demon bluff either. Um, it's just, I just think it's a little bit easier to use as a minion. Right. Being able to control the narratives of the game is really powerful in the hands of either team. So if you can convince people, oh yeah, it can't possibly be a uh, Nodashi game because I keep getting zeros or something like that, you might be able to hide your Nodashi, and that's a huge deal. Or even cast doubt on the people that are poisoned by them because you yeah. know, there's a... Uh, uh, that's a huge weakness for the Nodashi as well as the strength, is being able to find that certain people are poisoned. Alternatively, if you can somehow use your info to kind of convince people it's a Vortox game, that helps protect your Nodashi, but that's a little harder to do, because, as we said, the mathematician isn't very good at finding a Vortox. Yeah, and it's also pretty rare to, I think, convince people it's a Vortox game when it's not, for at least for very long. But yeah, it's certainly something you can try. Uh, you can always yeah. you can always just come out with the hey I got a three on the first night it has to be Vortox. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to try that and see if it works, but I have a feeling it would. It probably Most wouldn't. Vortox would not do that, <laughs> but it would be fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the other really strong thing that I mentioned was if the good team thinks they have everything figured out and their what they have figured out relies on there being no misinformation. If you're trusted enough, then you can just suddenly say, oh, hey, I got a one tonight, so something's wrong. We need to figure out what that is. And at the very least, you can be distracting and get people to focus on that instead of finding the demon or like going along with what the narrative was. Because now all of a sudden they have to disprove you in addition to showing that their narrative makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one example I like to give is, uh, say you're a minion, you're, you've 
acclaimed mathematician, you wake up in the morning and the recently deceased gleefully exclaims, I'm the sage, and the demon is one of those two people, and you know that they're right. Uh, you can pull them aside and say, hey, I've been getting a zero every night except last night. Maybe we should kill your neighbors instead of your targets. Yeah. So that's just one example of how a mathematician bluff used effectively by evil can cast doubt on really crucial information. Yeah, especially if it's something like that where there's like uh, very obviously one new piece of information. Yeah, I think I think yeah, that, I think Sage, is, specific yeah, Sage is probably one. the best example of that, where they haven't gotten any information for the rest of the game, and now suddenly they do. Yeah, so I think that's it's not too much more complicated than that. I can't think of any particularly like tricky plays you can do with it, really, um, because your information is kind of vague. Like it never is gonna it's never gonna point directly to one person as like being evil most of the time. Probably not. Not unless a player claims a role that should be counting, and you claim that they didn't count like if somebody calls if somebody says they're a sweetheart who died at night yeah and uh you try to say oh well you know my count isn't going up so i don't think you actually drunk to anybody i don't think you're actually the sweetheart you might cast a little doubt on their claim and make it look like maybe a figure well maybe not vigor mortis game since if that person was a minion they'd still be drunk somebody but <laughs> you get the point where you, you can kind of throw that off and say oh the philosopher that drunk somebody is probably lying because my number's not going up yeah so yeah, occasionally you can do something like that, but I find that in general it's probably going to be pretty difficult. So I, that would probably be the biggest downside to using this as an evil bluff is that um, at a crucial moment you might need to directly implicate one person but not be able to. Yeah. The other thing you can maybe do, and this requires some coordination with the evil team, is the exact opposite of what I just said, which is if one of your teammates is bluffing as the philosopher and drunk somebody who's in a character that's in play, you can say, oh, my number went up. So clearly they are actually the philosopher mm -hmm. who drunked that person. Yeah, that's a good point, too. One thing I will say as far as the number you say, so I think as good, zero is a good default. I think as evil, uh, at least after the first day, uh, saying a one is generally pretty hard to argue with because if you say a zero and a good player starts to figure out that their information doesn't make sense that can be bad for you but if you say a one then any one person who realizes their information is incorrect can just think that they're the one uh, so, mm -hmm. so I, I would tend to lean more on one if you're evil <laughs> yeah keeping some doubt in the mix is really important yeah plus then yeah at worst it makes people think that there's misinformation out there when maybe there isn't yeah, unless, like I said, you're trying to throw off the demon and both demons that you're trying to coordinate or confuse are demons that have low misinformation. Yeah, that's true. If it's actually a Vigor Mortis game and you have a couple evil players bluffing as outsiders, you might want to say, oh, it's I keep getting zeros, it's probably a Fangu game mm -hmm. to kind of support that. But, yeah. Beyond that, yes, keeping just doubt in general is really important. Basically, in SNV in general, the threat of, misinform of misinformation is almost as powerful as actual misinformation. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. All right, let's move on to section three then, running mathematician as the storyteller. I think this is one of the more interesting characters, not necessarily what information you give them, because usually that is dictated by the game, but deciding what to do with the other characters in the game is always going to influence how the mathematician works. Um, so I think that's part of what makes this a really interesting character for the storyteller. So let's start from the basics, when to put the mathematician in the game, etc. Uh, what are your thoughts? Whether I put the mathematician in depends more on the game balance almost. As we mentioned, it's a little weak in a Vortox game and quite useful in most of the other demon games. So I'll kind of just put it in as like a, a moderate character if I feel like the, the scales are already pretty balanced and I don't want to tip them either way. Yeah. Uh, not, not that it's a weak character, as we've discussed, it's very much the opposite, but I'll try to look at what else is in play and see, oh, Who's getting misinformation and how might that confuse the mathematician or how much i like to think about how it's going to affect the game like over the lifetime of the game so like obviously if there's misinformation right from the start then the mathematician is going to be a focus point otherwise they might be useful later if there's a philosopher or a sweetheart uh, or a vigor mortis then i know that the mathematician will likely come up later in the game as a crucial player so i like to think of those things uh, i don't think there's really a wrong way to use it putting it in a vortex game is probably like the most most decision you have to make about whether or not you want that in a vortex game because it can be less useful than the other characters but yeah so i think that in general it's a good character in most games and you want to think about how it's going to affect the narrative beforehand i i do really like playing the mathematician's information with the savant's information there's a game i was in recently on stream where as the savant one of my pieces of information was all players got correct information last night 
um, or something to that effect. Maybe it was, it might've been literally just like, no, there were no players whose abilities worked abnormally due to other characters. Like I basically got a mathematician statement as a savant. Uh, and I was able to coordinate with the mathematician to confirm that that, that thing was true, or at least I thought it possibly was. I think I later figured out that that mathematician was a minion or something. But yeah, basically it was like I could then use the mathematician to figure out whether or not that piece of information was true, and that told me what my other piece of information was. So I really like that uh, using mathematician with the savant. Yeah, as for giving it as a bluff, um, as mentioned in the Ip episode, uh, giving demon bluffs that can kind of facilitate plays for the evil team to make is always really interesting. And the mathematician, as we've kind of said, has a lot of potential to throw off which demon is in play. So based on which demon you're actually using, I would decide whether or not to use the mathematician, partly looking at what characters are in the game too. Uh, it's a good bluff for like Fangu games, I would say, or Vigor Mortis, characters without a lot of misinformation, because mm -hmm. they can create the image that there is misinformation. But it can, of course, go the other way as well. It can also be a pretty interesting bluff for Nodashi. We mentioned that it works well against Nodashi, but in the Nodashi's hands, the, the player can say, oh, I've been getting a zero, so the two people with wrong information next to me Hmm. You know this must be a Vortox game. Don't don't look at me. You know don't don't come after me. I'm totally not poisoning you. Yeah, <laughs> I think that no matter what the Nodashi has as a bluff, they're going to be thinking about ways to combat that. And mathematician might work, but it might also be very obvious that they're trying to cover up their the, uh, their own ability. But ultimately, yeah, that's maybe. their decision whether or not they want to use it. It could be better for them to like pass it off to a minion or something. But having someone bluff that there is a mathematician in the game in a Nodashi game can be very useful for them. Yeah, that's true. If you're standing up for yourself, it looks suspicious. If someone else is standing up for you, it makes you look a little better. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about more of the intricacies. Um, one of the things that when there's a mathematician in the game and it's a Vortex game, uh, I, will, I would warn you that you should not give them good information. Uh, this is... You would think that it's hard to give them good information in a Vortex game, but if you are ever doing one of those nights where you're just giving them some weird high number to indicate that there's a Vortox, um, just make sure you're not accidentally giving them the correct number. Because <laughs> it can happen. Yeah. Even in a Vortox game, you do still have to take the count just to make sure you don't give the right information. I've, I've seen people run Vortox and think, oh, it's a free pass. I don't have to worry about the mathematician. I hate counting it. It's, <laughs> it's so annoying. And then, you know, they mess it up and something doesn't add up and things get thrown out of whack yeah and especially when uh it gets later in the game and the amount of inf misinformation in the game goes down then maybe you've just been like giving the mathematician zero all game but suddenly a zero is true then yeah so you do have to pay attention to it still yeah and that could be super crucial because like like you said if you get a zero then you know it can't be a zero so if one person's if the demon's claiming flower girl and you get a zero you're probably going to trust them because they should have malfunctioned mm -hmm. so they add up with your info that's an example of where that wrong zero can really throw off the game because you might go after the other person who's not getting information because they don't add up with your ability uh what about the other misinformation in the game Oh, and actually, something uh, we should probably mention is how you how it works with daytime abilities. So you always learn about the abilities of the characters from the day before. Uh, so Savant and Artist, uh, when you give them their information in the day, you can use the Mathematician's Reminder Tokens at that point to keep track of whether or not they got uh, good or bad information. Yeah, in fact, you have to. Make sure to remember to do that. The Mathematician goes all the way back to the previous dawn, not the previous dusk. Yeah, so it's a little bit different on the first night because there was no preceding day, but every night after that, you have to keep track of the daytime information as well. Yeah, so I have a general piece of advice for storytelling Sex and Violets, especially in a Vortox game, and that is to try to conjure these false narratives at the start of the game and provide misinformation that is consistent among the good team that supports them. Mm -hmm. Paint a picture, or maybe a few pictures, because sometimes they get miss messed up by whatever the evil team's doing, and try to keep those guessing, or keep them guess guessing about which of these paintings is right. So how, how would you do that with Mathematician? Well, with a mathematician, you just kind of want to corroborate everything else. So, uh, for instance, one of my favorite pieces of information to give a savant on the first day, even though it doesn't sound very interesting, is that demon is A or demon is B. Like, the demon is a vigor mortis or the demon is a nodashi. Because by giving them those two split narratives, but not saying anything about the vortex, you've left the vortex being in play as a third possible narrative. You've kept that open. Generally, I like to try to keep options open for the evil team. I find that their backup plan when they're they're really cornered is to try to claim it's a Vortox game. Uh, so, you know, saying true statements and things that guarantee it's not a Vortox game is a bad idea. 
But in that example, if you want to keep giving the savant, for instance, info that says it's Vigamoris or Nodashi, and then you keep giving them info down those two different tracks, that other information in the game to imply that the Vigamoris is in this specific place or something, uh, then you'll you'll keep the Vortox as a possibility while going down that other narrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I explain that right? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think so. Uh, like, for instance, if you if you're pushing the narrative that there's a vigor mortis in play, then you can give mathematician info to go along with that. Like you can go zero, zero, one or something. Yeah. I think that thinking about how it all fits together is uh, interesting. I don't know if the good team is always going to pick up on the narrative that you think they should. Like you might give the perfect misinformation at night to point to one person being a particular demon and they just end up completely misinterpreting all the information they got and going with something completely different. <laughs> but I still think I do agree with you that uh, pushing towards certain narratives and having a consistent idea of what your of what overall p- picture you're painting is a really good idea. Yeah, it works really well for running Vordox games. It can be pretty challenging, and it helps if you work with the evil team a bit, because in your example, if you paint one person as the Nodashi, and everything else seems to support that because it's you know actually a Vortox game and all the info wrong happens to support it and then suddenly the demon decides to kill that player at night yeah suddenly the, everything goes out the window so coordinating with the evil team if you're able to hopefully your your group likes to talk to you to, to hide the savant mm-hmm. and therefore gives you a chance to talk to the evil players uh that's yeah that's something you have to kind of watch out for yeah uh, another thing you can do is uh think about how the misinformation that's in the game is going to affect the mathematician so in an odashi game maybe you want to give the uh, the players near the Nodashi true information. And that way they don't register to the mathematician and they don't really give a signal that there's a Nodashi in play. And then later in the game, start giving them false information so that from the mathematician's perspective, it's like, okay, a new source of misinformation has been created and that could really throw them off in the wrong direction uh, unless they're being very careful about how they go about to go through their information. Yeah, that's a good one. You can definitely give people correct information to confuse the mathematician number. And yeah, you can also you can do this do a similar thing in any case when like a sweetheart or a philosopher makes someone drunk and you can give them true information or especially with the sweetheart. Uh the sweetheart's such a flexible character because you get to choose who's drunk. You could just make someone drunk who doesn't get information anymore. Um or like the snake charmer who's just choosing themselves every night. And that can really throw a wrench in things. Yeah, there again, the possibility of misinformation can be just as bad as actual misinformation. If a sweetheart dies and nobody knows that she was actually poisoned or something, I guess that's not really possible in sex and violence, but... Or no, actually it is. If the philosopher drunks the sweetheart, and then the sweetheart (laughs) who's drunk dies, then nobody's actually drunk by the sweetheart. That's true, yeah. (laughs) Um, You can also like use the sweetheart to make the mathematician themselves drunk. And it'll make them think that possibly somebody else is drunk now, when in fact it's just them. <laughs> yeah, that'll make it really easy to support the wrong narrative. There again, we were talking about how you can kind of cast out the sage information if you suddenly get a one at that point. Yeah. So if you know you drunk the mathematician and the sage gets triggered, that's a huge backup plan for the evil team to kind of save them. Yeah. Yeah. In general, if you can suddenly make the mathematician drunk in the middle of the game, you can do some really interesting stuff. All right, I think the last point I wanted to get to here is what happens with the philosopher mathematicians registering to one another. (laughs) Uh, This is just something that is going to be pretty funny, where basically you can't, you can either give the old mathematician and the philosopher mathematician, you can give them the same number, because if the old mathematician doesn't malfunction and they get the same number as the new one, then neither of them has had anything abnormal happen and thus they're both getting correct things information or at like it's a really interesting situation to figure out how it works where say there is no misinformation in the night you wake up the original mathematician who is now drunk you tell them a one now the correct information is a one because their information has hasn't worked So it's like, now do you tell the other one a one, or is it still a zero? Like, I don't know. That's a really interesting situation, and I'm honestly not sure how to rule it. (laughs) Yeah, I think there's an order of operations problem there. And I I remember there being some discussion a while back between the chambermaid and the mathematician. The chambermaid is supposed to see who woke up tonight, and the mathematician, of course, counts what happened in the past day. So both of those characters, due to the way they're written, are supposed to act last at night because they affect things that have happened previously. 
And if you put both of them in the same set, I don't think it's really clear which one acts first or last, and it definitely can matter the way yeah. they're written. I think Hopefully that, there'll be some clarifications later. I think there but, actually might be a clarification yeah. on that particular one already, which is, I think the two are, they have like a um, a jinx rule. I, I'm not sure if I'm remembering this Something correctly. Something like that. But I think there, there's a jinx rule where it says like the chambermaid learns who has woken up or will wake up. Yeah, something like that. I think that's right. At least that's how I would rule it. Yeah, it's a little bit murkier with mathematician, though, with two mathematicians registering to one another. <laughs> uh, because yeah. it's like, what order do you wake them in? And like, what is true depends on kind of how you look at the situation. Uh, I personally would just rule it as whichever one I wake first, I give them information based on the game state at that exact moment. Yeah, I think that's the right thing to do since that's how the rest of the game works. If somebody dies at night, then you, from that point on, they're dead and yeah. you don't wake them up and so on. So that makes the most sense. The only question is, which one do you wake up first? And I don't think the game has any official clarification on that. I personally would try to clear that with my group beforehand, and I think how I would rule it is the philosopher goes first. But that's just kind of arbitrary. That's just my, my gut instinct of the philosopher generally being first in the set. Yeah, that's interesting. Not that they would wake up at the philosopher night order. You know, They'd still wake up at the mathematician spot, but I would still put them first. Yeah, my personal instinct is actually do it the other way around i don't really know why but that's just what my my gut instinct on that yeah there's just there's no clarification for that so yeah and i'm actually i haven't this kind of like just occurred to me recently so i feel i'm gonna like start a discussion about this in the, in the the unofficial discord server and see if i can root out any more information i wish i had done it before the recording but this is a niche enough situation that you should be able to make a call <laughs> and i will watch that with interest because i'm very curious all right. Well, I think that about brings us to the end of the mathematician discussion. Perhaps appropriately, this is the one uh, character where there have been the most situations that I don't know the exact ruling on. Uh, it would be nice to have a mathematician to tell me how many I got wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think overall, this is still a good discussion. Um, so thanks for being on the show, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks everyone at home for listening. If you... If you enjoyed the show, keep listening to it. I don't know why. I never know how to end these things exactly. <laughs> I hope we shed some light on a character that's very overlooked and underrated, and I hope people start to appreciate the mathematician a little more going forward. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, thanks everyone for listening, and you'll hear from me and another special guest in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm.